Hello everybody. On behalf of uh, International IDEA and uh, InterParis, I may welcome you to the closing session of the International Democracy Week 2020, organized together with the European Endowment for Democracy, European Partnership for Democracy, the European Network of Political Foundations and Carnegie Europe, and supported by the European Parliament. I wish a warm welcome to the distinguished speakers, colleagues and all the participants who join us online via the European Parliament uh, live stream website or the YouTube channel. We are very much delighted to have you all here with us. My name is Marilyn Neven. I'm Programme Manager at International Ideas Europe Programme in Brussels and I will be moderating this session for you today. Well, as I said, we are honoured to welcome to this session uh, the Speaker of the People's Majlis, Mr. Mohamed Nasheed, Member of the European Parliament, Mr. Thomas Toubé, the Director for People and Peace at the European Commission, Ms. Henriette Geiger, who will kindly stand in for European Commissioner Jutta Urpilainen today, and Secretary General of International Idea, Kevin Casasamora, who is also former Vice President of Costa Rica. The Vice President of the European Parliament, Mr. Fabio Castaldo, will also join us uh, very soon. This session is organized by International Ideas Inter-Paris Program, which is the EU's flagship global program to strengthen the capacity of parliaments and implemented by International Idea. And International Idea does that in partnership with the European Parliament and the 27 European Union member state parliaments. Participants who are familiar with the Inter-Paris team know the tremendous drive they have to implement this project for DG DEFCO, focusing on international peer-to-peer -peer assistance, knowledge development and the organization of conferences and workshops on topics of high relevance to parliaments and their functioning. As you may know, this year's online edition of the International Day of Democracy Conference has become a Democracy Week and it concentrated on the impact of COVID-19 on democracy. This particular session, the closing session, will zoom in on how parliaments needed to adapt during the crisis and how sustainable those changes are. We have the honour to present two session parts today. This one is a light, the first one is a high level uh, part and there is one practitioner's part. Participants will be able uh, to ask questions to the practitioners who will join us later. I also cordially invite you to uh, join this comfort, uh, conversation act um, actively during that second part of the session and you can send in your questions via the chat on the YouTube channel or Twitter uh, but then please use the hashtag uh, Democracy Week 2020. My colleagues will help to collect them and so that they can be answered uh, by the speakers. We have one hour 45 minutes for this entire event so I think it is high time that I pass on the floor to our eminent speakers. I ask uh, the speakers in the meantime to mute your microphones when you are not speaking uh, to ensure the audio quality. To ensure that quality, I do my part and therefore I have the headset on today. May I now invite uh, Secretary General Kevin Casasamora to start the session with a welcome address on behalf of International IDEA as the host of this session. The Secretary General recently spearheaded a call to defend democracy in times of COVID-19, which is supported by almost 100 organizations and nearly 500 prominent individuals across the globe. We look forward to hearing about why well-functioning parliaments remain essential for democratic development and how assistance providers as international idea can strengthen them. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General, also because you have participated in previous sessions during the, this Democracy Week. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh... Marilyn for the very kind introduction and and thank you also to the team of International Idea in Brussels and the co-organizers uh, 
uh, for putting together a truly fantastic program uh, over the past uh, few days. I would also like to uh, welcome some of the very prominent speakers of today's session, uh, Fabio Castaldo, Mohamed Nasheed, Thomas Tobe, uh, Henriette Geiger. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this, of this discussion, and we are honored to, uh, to have you. Before I give the floor to our eminent guests, I would like to recapitulate, uh, recapitulate some of the incredibly interesting, topical, and, and truly crucial issues that have been raised in the course of this year's Democracy Week. These topics truly speak to the many relevant and to some extent greatly unexplored angles in which COVID-19, uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic has and will continue to affect democracy and human rights. For those of you who weren't there, I can only say that uh, we've had fantastic discussions on the state of global democracy, European foreign policy and democracy support amidst the pandemic, but also We've had forward-looking sessions on the future of democracy after the pandemic, on how digital technologies are changing the political landscape, on the impact of COVID-19 on, on, on the media and, and the rise of disinformation, on how political parties are operating in the pandemic, and even last but not least about the, the demonstrations and the protest movement in Belarus. The red thread through the whole week has been that we cannot take our democracies for granted and that we need to defend democracy because it is the only system that can respond to the unprecedented challenges humanity faces today. Not only that, to the extent that it is the only system that respects our inherent dignity as human beings, it is the only political arrangement that allows us to envision a better future for generations to come. We are at a critical juncture when it comes to our democratic institutions. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought not only health and economic challenges, in fact, it is testing our governance structures and democratic processes in very acute ways. Already now, we can see this clearly by analyzing the data in our global monitor developed with the support of the European Commission, which tracks the impact of COVID-19 measures on democracy and human rights in 162 countries, or the Interpares Parliamentary Data Tracker, which maps how parliaments have responded to the pandemic. Uh, and it is also a very valuable tool in this, in this regard. From our analysis, we have seen how unforgiving this crisis has been in exposing pre-existing ills in democracies all over the world. Leadership deficits, polarization, weak governance structure, underinvestment in public goods, and a very serious erosion in trust in public institutions. We have seen how authoritarian rulers under the guise of pandemic-related measures have tightened their grip on power, silenced critics, and circumvented democratic processes. We have seen how governments have harassed, muscled, and jailed journalists in an attempt to limit citizens' access to information under the pretext of fighting disinformation. We have seen how emergency powers have been invoked to do things that have nothing to do with the pandemic and everything to do with the intention of shutting down critical voices, limiting civic spaces, and harassing minorities. We have seen examples of emergency powers deployed to curtail the free flow of information and enhance the state surveillance with little regard for privacy. 
We have seen emergency powers being used to get the military involved in internal affairs in countries that have a disturbing history of coups and military tutelage. What have we learned from all this? Perhaps one of the most important lessons in stemming from, uh, from all this is that there is nothing inevitable about the advance and sustainability of democracy. Democracy is neither created nor maintained by itself. It is something that requires continuous vigilance, dedication, and support. And I certainly hope that this crisis will prompt donors and assistant uh, providers to enhance dialogue, coordination, and cooperation to support democracy and the rule of law around the world. We are starting to see signs of that. Just yesterday, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, highlighted in her State of the Union speech, and here I quote, democracies and a community of law are our founding values, but we need to nurture them, identify challenges, and find solutions, end of quote. Finding solutions and sparks of hope is indeed particularly important, especially at a time when the narrative for democracy is surrounded by an unrelenting tone of doom and gloom. We have to shift the tone. Now is the time to remind ourselves that with, as with all great challenges also come great opportunities. For democracies to remain relevant and resilient, we need to dare to rethink, renovate, and reinvent them so that they are able to withstand this and future challenges, including intergenerational ones such as climate change. This also means that they need to be prepared, better prepared, for the technological and scientific realities of the 21st century, for the new ways of interacting with citizens and leveraging new forms of political engagement. This urgent need to rethink how our democracies should work offers a huge opportunity. And if this is true for democratic institutions as a whole, it is particularly true about parliaments around the world. Parliaments are the core democratic institutions to represent citizens, to enable the diverse views of citizens to be heard at every stage of the political process, to create the legal covenants that govern society, to ensure that governments implement their agenda effectively and fairly, to oversee that the taxpayers' resources are indeed used to pay for the best possible public goods and services. During a crisis, those roles, duties, and responsibilities must be carried out, but at an extraordinary speed and in unpredictable or even adverse circumstances. How best can parliaments respond to these challenges than by learning from one another, by building each other up through sharing best practices and lessons learned? This is exactly what Interpares Parliaments in Partnership project aims to do. Interpares is the EU's flagship global program supporting parliaments worldwide. And it is implemented by international idea, and I'm very proud of that. We implemented in partnership with the European Parliament and the 27 European Union member state parliaments. What better way to conclude International Democracy Week, then with a conversation about Parliament's responses during the COVID-19 pandemic, and particularly about the implications of virtual parliaments and their role in strengthening democratic governance. I would like to thank the European Commission for an incredibly fruitful cooperation on this initiative and all or other important projects. I would also like to thank the European Parliament for the excellent support in the organization of this Democracy Week 2020. Both the European Commission and the European Parliament have been wonderful in conveying their unwavering support for democracy worldwide. 
Last but not least, I would like to thank our partner organizations for this week's successful conference, the European Endowment for Democracy, the European Partnership for Democracy, the European Network of Political Foundations, and Carnegie Europe, all wonderful friends and colleagues. There has never been a better time to join forces to build better and more resilient democratic institutions. In fact, at this critical juncture, we need to go beyond simply defending democracy, important though that is. The very magnitude of this crisis is bestowing upon us the unique chance to expand the frontiers of what's possible. We need to seize this enormous opportunity with both hands. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General, for the excellent warm up of uh, the session and also for your inspiring message uh, on uh, defending democracy. I know that you have another speaking engagement at three o'clock, so feel free uh, to leave this session uh, whenever you need to. And thank you very much again for taking your time uh, to join us in this very busy Democracy Week. Now, Mrs. Harriet Geiger, Director for People and Peace at the European Commission's Directorate General for uh, Development and Cooperation, will provide remarks on behalf of the European Commission as the funding partner of the Interparis Programme. Mrs. Geiger, thank you for stepping in for Commissioner of Bilainen, who regrets not being able to join us because of a last-minute conflicting engagement. The European Commission, and DG DEFCO in particular, is a lead actor in promoting human rights and democracy around the world. We are delighted to hear from you about the place of parliamentary strengthening in EU development cooperation and democracy <laughs> support, also now in times of COVID-19. Mrs. Geiger, thank you, and you have the screen and the floor. Thank you very much, Marilyn, and thank you, Dr. Casa Samoa, for your passion, for your passionate statement, and for the passion you put into the implementation of this very important project. I fully subscribe to your views. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, let me convey the greetings and the apology of my commissioner, Jutta Urpilainen who can't be with us this afternoon, but allow me to make some remarks on her behalf. This, week's, this week we celebrated the International Democracy Week at an exceptional time. Each and every one of us has settled into the uncomfortable new reality of pandemic life. But one thing we should never settle for is democracy being undermined or attacked and parliaments are the central institution of any democracy. They are in fact the oldest of all democratic institutions. They reflect pluralism and diversity in our societies. They legitimize the rule of law through their legislative function. And they are pivotal in ensuring accountability of the executive to the people. And this last one is really very central in these times of the pandemic. We can come to that later. So my commissioner, Opi Leinen, has been for many years a member of the national parliament in her home country, Finland. And that's why she feels so strongly and she's so convinced that democracies deliver best where parliaments are strong. At the EU level, citizens are represented directly in the European Parliament. This is why, since taking office as EU Commissioner, Commissioner Opi Leinen made engaging with the European Parliament one of her top priorities. And she is fully committed to contribute to further strengthen efforts and initiatives of the EPA in favor of democracy. If parliaments are crucial to democracy, so is supporting parliaments around the world as an important part of the EU's external cooperation. And our 
comprehensive approach towards democracy protection. So in this way, last year we launched at the European Parliament the new project called Interpares that Dr. Casa Samoa was already describing. It's our EU flagship project on parliamentary strengthening. It's unique and it's the first of its kind and it's implemented by International IDEA. Interpares is unique for two reasons. To begin with, it's the first ever EU-funded parliamentary support project with a worldwide scope. So it's an experiment in its own kind. Second, it has a very special implementation modality because it is built around peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Hence its name, Interpares Among Peers. So, our aim is to strengthen parliamentary democracy by promoting and facilitating exchanges between EU member state parliaments and partner parliaments around the world. And whether exchanging on legislative drafting techniques with Bhutan, sharing experiences on parliament's budgetary role with Malaysia, or engaging on dialogues about parliamentary administration reform with Panama, the active participation of EU member state parliaments has proven invaluable so far. And parliamentarians to parliamentarians speak the same language. They understand each other. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, we have focused a lot on health crisis and the socio-economic crisis mitigation. But there's a third dimension that we have prioritized. The impact of the pandemic on human rights and democracy worldwide. And parliaments play a crucial role in this regard. In times of crisis, parliaments must adapt. And more importantly than ever, continue to exercise their democratic duties. From the moment the COVID outbreak turned into a pandemic, the EU institutions and the member states teamed up and as a team Europe took swift coordinated action to help our partners. And as part of our overall response to the pandemic, through our partnership with IDEA, we launched Back in July, the Global Monitor on COVID-19 Impact on Democracy and Human Rights. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Casa Samoa was already alluding to this. The results are devastating. It shows widespread disproportionate restrictions on civil liberties with the imposition on the of the state of emergency freedom of expression curtailed widely, media restrictions all over, crackdown on the opposition, suspension of parliaments in 34 countries, limited court activities in 66% of countries. So really, this is a critical situation. And we hope that parliaments around the world will find Democracy Week celebrations. Let me state once more that the European Union will continue to stand unequiv unequivocally for democracy, rule of law and human rights, and will continue to support parliaments around the world in times of crisis and beyond. And Dr. Casa Samoa already said, the State of the Union speech of Commission President von der Leyen yesterday in Parliament makes it very clear that the EU will not waver on its strong adherence to the fundamental values both within the EU and in the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mrs. Geiger, for highlighting the importance of the initiatives uh, of the EU related uh, to COVID-19 and uh, parliamentary support. And uh, I very much welcome the personal commitment of the Commissioner also on democracy and the essential role of parliaments in strong democracies. So thank you very much for that. Perhaps uh, may I ask by way of a follow-up how you see the EU's interinstitutional cooperation on democracy and parliamentary development? Um, what, we, what we have done in the EU um, is we have adjusted in record speed all our current programs and, and projects to ensure that we have maximum impact on the ground uh, despite the difficult circumstances. And uh, we brought through front loading of financial resources, direct support immediately to those most in need. And um, in our new policies and programs, we are factoring the pandemic fully into our approach, not only in health, but across the board. This will obviously influence the programming of our future cooperation and the big changes here is that we work, as I said, in a Team Europe approach with our member states together for maximum impact. And we use digitalization as principal tool wherever possible, especially uh, to extend basic services like health and education to remote um, population. But regarding the policy and programming on human rights and democracy, in the development of the recent EU action plan on human rights and democracy for external action, the negative impact of the pandemic on human rights and democracy has already been factored in. And we are redoubling our efforts to counteract the shrinking space for fundamental freedoms and the curtailing of basic, basic rights. But while it is key that we provide concrete support to our partners on the ground and to our global human rights and democracy advocates through the EIDHR budget line, it is key that we speak with one voice in the EU strongly and firmly to uphold democracy and human rights. And there you have seen that um, there is a groundbreaking proposal in the State of the Union speech of Ursula von der Leyen yesterday, where she proposed that we should introduce qualified majority voting in the Council on Human Rights and Sanctions. This will be a huge step towards a stronger voice of the EU as a lighthouse for fundamental democratic values. But we will need all institutions to be united on this. And the EP support and its outreach to support parliaments in partner countries is much needed. We need that sort of watchdog function more than ever. And this uh, ties in with the political dialogue. So programs on one side can only do that much, but we need a political dialogue with different sectors of the society. There is also key that we engage with civil society, not only in our partner countries, but also at the global level for global advocacy. I can only say that the Commission will use all its toolbox, all its instruments to counteract, to counteract the, the devastating impact the pandemic had on democracy and fundamental freedoms. But we cannot do it alone. In order to be able to impact, we need to stand all together and the Parliament and the Council, our member states, and civil societies, each one has a very unique role to play. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mrs. Geiger. Fantastic. And I would uh, take uh, also the opportunity again uh, to thank and commend DigiDefco for supporting the, the Paris program in such an engaged way. Thank you very much. I now have the honor to welcome and introduce the Vice President of the European Parliament, Mr. Fabio Castaldo. Welcome, Mr. Castaldo. Great that you could join us in the meantime. Uh, Mr. Castaldo is a vice president, as vice president, also responsible for in, in democracy, among other policy areas. Fabio Castaldo has been a vice president since 2017 as the youngest one in history, and he was re-elected in uh, 2019. The European Parliament is an important partner for the Inter-Paris programme and uh, part of its steering committee. Experiences from the European Parliament's response to COVID-19 will undoubtedly provide us with a number of best practices that could be useful for other parliaments as well. Thank you, Mr. Castaldo. Uh, I give the floor, floor to you. Thank you very much, dear Marilyn, and thanks and good afternoon to everyone. I would like to say that I'm really delighted to take part to this important debate, and I also would like to thank the organizers of this event, uh, starting from Mr. Casas Zamora, Secretary General of International IDEA. Um, to me, I would like also to thank uh, Mrs. Geiger, uh, the, the Director for People and Peace, Director, the DEVCO Director of the Commission, for the important commitment uh, she took during her speech, uh, inspiring speech uh, a few minutes ago on behalf uh, of Commissioner Urpi Leinen, and also all the other speakers that, speakers that will take the floor after me that who will undoubtedly add the value to this very interesting conversation in a time that, uh, as it has been said previously, is putting democracy facing uh, important crisis and uh, looking for new uh, ways to to lead, to lead democracy, of course, uh, tackling and facing the important uh, uh, barriers and obstacles we took because of the pandemic. The rapid, the rapid expansion of COVID-19 has forced some parts of the world, at least initially, to, paralyze, to paralysis. At the same time, it forced governments worldwide to, to make, though, clear-sighted decision in the briefest possible time. In such an exceptional and serious situation, the concentration of powers in the government was to some extent inevitable, and it was more necessary than ever for Parliament to monitor and direct its work, especially if we take into account the significant limitations to fundamental rights introduced, so as to maintain the balance and change among the powers intrinsic to any form of government. In order to comply with the prescription imposed to prevent the spread of the virus, parliaments worldwide were forced to suspend their normal activity to concentrate almost exclusively on, ex on the examination of urgent and un unavoidable acts and on those closely related to the health and economic consequences of the epidemiological emergency we were facing. Furthermore, they had to explore and experiment new methods of scrutiny, debate, and voting. Remote participation proved to be a viable solution to allow Parliament to gradually return to their normal operations in the fullness of its, uh, their political composition. The European Parliament moved fast to ensure an efficient hybrid parliamentary democracy during the pandemic shifting all the activities that could be held in online modus to a digital parliament while maintaining a minimal physical parliament for those activities that could not be held digitally. One of the most complicated aspects of the parliamentary activities to be adapted to the circumstances of the social distancing measures was voting. For some national parliaments, remote voting was impossible because the laws didn't allow it or because for some votes, a physical quorum had to be respected. Already in March, the European Parliament held the voting procedures for the first time in history nearly entirely remotely via an alternative electronic voting system. 
the participation of members of in the voting session with up to 692 members casting their votes was comparable to members participation in voting sessions with members physically present in the chamber the use of digital tools in, the, in our parliament in our house and in particular for voting raises several challenges like the possibility of fraud and even uh, internet bandwidth technical problems like as bad sound, connection issues, and unequal digital literacy and skills. However, they also brought the major advantages, such as the greater accessibility for physically impeded parliamentarians to perform their duties on a par with their, own, with the, their other colleagues and a higher attendance of parliamentarians during the sessions. Digital, dig, digitalizing parliaments does not undermine their legitimacy. On the contrary, people are quite positive about the digital sessions. Partially transferring the democratic activity online increased transparency as countries were forced to stream live sessions of parliamentary debates. And moreover, the digitalization has narrowed the gap between parliamentarians and citizens. Parliamentarians had to learn new digital skills that enable them to extend the democratic debate to their constituents and to innovate wider democratic engagement. The European Parliament provided members with language and computer courses. And moreover, hybrid devices configured to be integrated in the European Parliament internal network and with a high security standards were distributed to them to the all the MPs and staff to allow everyone to work remotely in an efficient and safe way. I am also a member of the Constitutional Affairs Committee, the so-called AFCO Committee, and I was directly involved in the attempt to codify the rules for the Digital Parliament within the AFCO Working Group, working group on the Rules of Procedures. The report is now under discussion, and it has the ambitious purpose to create standards and procedures to regulate Digital Parliament during emergency. I personally propose a procedure that allows the President to declare the transition from ordinary procedures to the use of telematics procedures in case of emergency. In the final text of the working group, moreover, a toolbox of measures available to the president to be activated in case of emergency and with all the counterbalance of the control of the uh, conference of the presidents and the, in the final, as a final instance, of course, to the plenary uh, and will, the, will be introduced with the, some tools that are proportioned to the entity of the said emergency. Sometimes, dear friends, crisis situations may create a unique window of, of opportunity that may lead to reforms in, the, in policy, institution, as well as in society. The emergency linked to the COVID-19 pandemic has given us no alternative but to digitalize our democracy. Remote participation was mainly treated, uh, treated as an emergency solution that allowed parla parliaments to resume their work and to return to most of its normal oper operations. However, given the many advantages that properly thought and regulated the digital parliaments could bring to democracy, the gradual or partial digitalization of the, of the decision-making process may also be considered, in my opinion, as a viable alternative that may produce cost-saving effects without affecting the efficiency of the functioning of the parliament, but rather, uh, rather in enriching it from a certain point of view. Parliament learned a lot about how to combine technology and democracy together and sh should not easily dismiss the potential of this new relationship. We need to consider the digitalization as a positive consequence of the pandemic crisis. And so policymakers should take the advantage of this momentum and use technology to extend the reach of dialogue and to diversify ideas in the policymaking process. This can be the first step towards exploring the new forms of participation in the democratic life of a country, such as participative and deliberative democracy. I have always advocated for the use of new technologies to bring citizens closer to the institution and to explore new forms of, of participation in democratic, uh, democratic activities. A digitalized democracy can provide an accessible and responsible method of control over legislation in a way that differs from the, the relatively untransparent parliamentary process that are, or for the most part, understood only by those who work in, in it and on it. Digit digitalization will also make it easier to involve experts in decision-making process. However, these digital process and developments can only take place if governments invest in digital democracy and they create the capacity to, to allow to this digital democratic forum to take place 
of course, always in the full respect of our constitutional law and founding uh, fundamental principles. Parliamentarians should use what they have learned and the expertise of the democratic touch technology to build the greater trust in public institution and to open up traditional processes to wider deliberation, bringing people closer to the source of democratic power. Governments should take advantage of this momentum in both public attitudes and technological capabilities to transform decision making for the better. And I can assure our colleagues and friends from the national parliament that the European Parliament will continue to be open, accessible and totally committed to the idea to have a strong cooperation among each other to exchange good practices and to build up together the new forms and new ways of interaction with the citizens that will allow to democracy to do not uh, also be locked in lockdown and on the other hand also to explore all the possible interaction to make the citizens feeling involved not every once every five years, but every day, part of our democratic life and part of our, of our democratic and European way of understanding and developing democracy. So please just be aware that the European Parliament is here to build up this process together with you. And thank you so much once more for the occasion to take the floor in such a very important and rich debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, for these uh, very nice words. And uh, you gave an interesting testimony on how the European Parliament and other parliaments continue to function throughout uh, the crisis, embracing these uh, digital uh, processes. Uh, we will go deeper into some elements uh, that you mentioned uh, during the expert session following uh, this one. Thank you again for uh, tuning in uh, with us and uh, I am now delighted uh, to welcome the Honourable Speaker of the Majlis of the Republic of the Maldives, Mr. Mohamed Nasheed. He was the Maldives' first democratically elected president and often called the Mandela of the Maldives. Wonderful that you could make it uh, uh, to be here uh, today. The People's Majlis was a very early innovator, uh, becoming one of the first parliaments to operate virtually. President Ashid, could you enlighten us on how the virtual parliament became operational and what are the gains and losses for democratic debate and other parliamentary functions? The floor is yours. Uh, well, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kevin Kass and uh, uh, Jonathan Murphy. Uh, everyone present here, Vice President um, Mr. Castaldo, lovely to see you again. Uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, me and the Maldives Parliament uh, to this most important uh, gathering. Uh, before I go back to your direction of the question, if I may, uh, just try to outline how very important it is for the Maldives this Democracy Week. Uh, that the IDEA, International IDEA Foundation and the European Parliament together are marking. We had autocratic rule for 30 years until uh, 2008. Uh, our people, we were able to galvanize our people to political activism. Uh, we formed a political party first in exile. And while in exile, we were able to speak to the people again very much through digitally. We were able to galvanize our people and we were able to impress upon the rulers then the need to amend the constitution and to have free and fair elections. We went back to the Maldives, uh, we continued with our fight and finally we were able to amend the constitution and we had our first multi-party elections in 2008 which I was fortunate enough to have won. But uh, democracy doesn't stay, um, as very well pointed out here. Uh, it, it is not sustainable by itself. People have to sustain it. Uh, we were very unfortunate in 2012. We again had a coup and we lost our government. And then we were in the wilderness down and under for the last seven years. The people of the Maldives never gave up. Uh, they continued with their activism. And then finally again in 2008, we were able to have another election and uh, we are back in government again. 
Uh, on how relevant and important uh, getting the majlis, getting the parliament to keep on functioning, whatever, sun or shine, rain or hay, all the time. Uh, uh, it is the cornerstone, it is the center of all political activity, the parliament is. And we must be able to continue that debate going. I am very happy to say uh, that the Maldives Parliament, the People's Majlis, was actually the first parliament to start uh, our sittings uh, virtually. Uh, we were able to uh, amend our house rules. We had an emergency session uh, to do that, and we took that risk of infection, but we still uh, amended our uh, house rules, and we allowed uh, the house uh, to vote and to debate um, virtually. Uh, we were we are very pleased that we were able to do that. Uh, we were able to not only give money, extra money to the government when it needed, uh, increase money supply for them, but we were also able to scrutinize the spending of that money. Uh, uh, we were able to bring in the Auditor General uh, and to scrutinize COVID spending, which is, which is very important for good governance. Money is people's money, it's taxpayers' money, and we cannot do whatever we like with them, with it. So we were able to do that and then uh, continue the parliament. But uh, again, um, uh, one and a half months into the lockdown, the people of the Maldives and we felt that we had to sit. We had to go in there and we had to have our debates in person. There is nothing like a in-person debate. The main function of a parliament is a debate. And by definition, a debate involves throwing hands, shouting at each other, and the occasional shoe flying to the speaker. Now, if you are not able to have that, that takes away uh, uh, the attention, that takes away the interest of the people from the parliament. We have to get we have to get the people watching it. We have to be, get the people observing it all the time, and to do that, you have to provide them what they want. You have to provide them a lively debate. Yes, uh, during times of pandemic and during difficult times, it's very very important, as uh, Vice President pointed out, that digital democracy continues. That's, that's very, very important. But we must realize, we must understand that it's far easier in developed democracies. But uh, in emerging democracies, where there is always forces trying to suppress democracy, it is very, it's very volatile to only rely upon virtual means. Uh, you can control debate, you can control speech, you can control everything if you attempt to do it only through virtually. So, yes, but the pandemic has given us uh, an insight, an idea on how we may be able to proceed with governance while there are difficulties. But at the same time, we've also understood, look, man, this is how you do it. You have to sit around and you have to shout at each other. Um, I can't, I can't think of our parliament not being able to sit physically and actually get this job done. We have very lively uh, members from different, forming different ideas, different colors, and they bring uh, a, a whole uh, a set of views to the parliament, a whole, a whole rainbow of views to the parliament that it has to continue sitting. Again, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, the parliament, uh, and we thank you for inviting us to do this, to be able to speak to you. And we thank the European Union for your uh, close observation, your assistance and your programs on developing political parties and, uh, and giving capacity to parliaments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President, uh, for sharing that uh, great experience you have and also your vision on how parliaments uh, can function and uh, continue to build on improvements in a post-pandemic uh, period. Um, 
I will, uh, for time reasons, uh, we will uh, turn to a member of the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Thomas Tobe, who is the chair of the European Parliament Development Committee and in this capacity also co-chairs the Democracy and Election Coordination Group uh, of the European Parliament, DEG, which oversees uh, the Parliament's election observation mission. I also would like to note that Mr. Tobe is from Sweden, where International Idea holds uh, its headquarters. So, Mr. Tobe, very welcome, and please, you can take the floor. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, firstly, just uh, let me welcome that I have this opportunity to uh, listen to the distinguished uh, speakers uh, today. And hopefully also I can uh, contribute with uh, some uh, reflection uh, that might be uh, of uh, interest uh, to you. I mean, let me say that as a chair of uh, the development committee, and I would also actually say as a Swede, of course, I mean, questions of democracy, uh, human rights, rule of law, uh, it's it, in the center of my heart. So I really think that this is important and we need to discuss this uh, even more. Um, I think it's, it's quite clear that we can, of course, uh, see that now we can see an uprising in, in Belarus uh, that hopefully will lead uh, to democratic reforms uh, in the end. Uh, but to be honest, uh, I'm more uh, worried uh, than I am hopeful uh, at the moment, because it, it's quite clear that uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, of course, is something that we need to work with globally uh, to uh, defeat. Uh, but it's also very clear that this creates uh, a big opportunities for some uh, authoritarian political leaders uh, to use this. And this is what we, this is actually what we're uh, seeing examples of. Uh, and I think uh, Director Geiger is, is really to the point uh, mentioning that the European Parliament now really, really has to be a watchdog now uh, when it comes to the scrutiny and what's going on. And I would also say that Europe now, we need to make sure that we are leaders now when it comes to these questions. So to be honest amongst friends here, I mean, we do see uh, from Russia becoming more aggressive. We can see that China is uh, basically uh, pushing uh, to make sure uh, that they increase their power and it is not the same as increasing uh, rule of law and democracy around the world. And we can see that the American administration is more focused on America first. I mean, where I think uh, President von der Leyen was really to the point saying there is no Europe first, that we are committed now to make sure that we are an advocate for multilateralism, democracy and, and human rights. When it comes uh, to, the, to the work uh, in the European Parliament and in the, the Development uh, Committee, I would like just to make uh, three uh, reflections. Uh, firstly, uh, my conclusion is that Parliament is working. I mean, the Development Committee is, is working. Uh, at the beginning, uh, everybody raised questions, and is this even going to work? But I mean, we have been able uh, to make sure that, uh, of course, we have had to adopt uh, our work uh, uh, in the parliament. But I would like to, to highlight that I have seen as chairman uh, that the political groups in the European parliament all uh, have tried to contribute to make sure that we can be pragmatic in this very different time and make sure that we have had a function and uh, work uh, in the committee. I mean, we have done our work with uh, scrutiny, of course. We have had a lot of exchanges with, of course, Commissioner Opelainen and Lenarchit. Uh, we have had a, a lot of uh, important uh, discussion where we are also now, for example, taking decision to have a new report on how COVID-19 now will uh, affect uh, humanitarian aid uh, and development. Because, of course, we have a big risk now that we will see a setback when it comes to achieving uh, our SDGs uh, and Agenda uh, 2030. So I would say the first reflection is that the Parliament is working. Yes, we have to adopt, but it is working, and I think this is important. I can also tell you as a personal <laughs> reflection uh, that I myself have been in, in quarantine for two weeks because I got affected uh, from COVID. And this way of working actually made sure that I could actually still lead the work from quarantine uh, and make sure that it, it, it was, was working. Uh, 
Um, secondly, uh, I would say that, uh, of course, uh, there are some downsides that we need also to uh, reflect on. Uh, of course, we don't have uh, enough uh, committee uh, time uh, to work with all uh, the important issues. Uh, that is a fact. And then we, we need to make sure to uh, enhance this and try to make sure that uh, parliamentary work is not only focused on uh, COVID-19 uh, and the most uh, important fires. Uh, we need to step up our game that what we've done has been uh, okay, but it's not enough, I would say, uh, due to the challenges uh, that we see in the world. I would also like to mention actually that uh, this, uh, I would say, uh, increased opportunity uh, for uh, political leaders to make the decision. Of course, you can also see that in the European Parliament. Of course, more of the political work is now uh, powered even more from the leadership of the political groups chairmen uh, in the committee and i would say that we are decreasing the role for the individual uh, member in the european parliament uh, because there's not enough space basically to make sure that we can make sure that all meps can be involved uh, in the political work and that is something that i think it is important for us to also uh, reflect on uh, I would also uh, like to say that uh, not only in the world have we seen uh, worrying uh, steps taken by government, but also within Europe, uh, I would say that we have say, seen uh, some political decision that is uh, worrying. And I think it's important that if we are going to be a strong voice in the world, we need to do our work uh, at home in Europe as well uh, and, and not uh, be ashamed to actually uh, talk about this. Um, thirdly, I would like to, to mention, and this might sound a bit, um, uh, how should I put it, uh, uh, ridiculous, but I don't think it is. Uh, what we're losing now, yes, we have this digital opportunity to talk to each other. It's easy for me now to interrogate with uh, civil society, to have meetings. Uh, you don't have to travel to New York to have a, a meeting with an organization. Now it's quite clear that we just meet in this way. But I would say that policymaking is, of course, uh, well prepared in the institution, but many of uh, the policymaking is actually done in the meeting, the physical meetings between politicians, the informal interaction, the opportunity to, to look at each other, try to understand the body language, uh, try to shake hands and make a political agreement. That is hard enough. Uh, and I think that is uh, something that I really do miss. Uh, and I, we need to find a way uh, to get back to that more, because otherwise I think that policy work uh, will suffer. And we need to make sure that this works, because this is not something that is, is going away. Uh, in the Development co Committee, in the European Parliament, we are at least uh, making sure that this will be our reality when it comes to our work for at least one more year. This is not going away in two or three months. Uh, this is, in a way, the new normal. Of course, it's not going to be the new normal forever, but this is how we have to, to adapt. Uh, but I think uh, we all now have a big responsible, this responsibility now to push for democracy and human rights, and I will make sure that the Development Committee and the European Parliament uh, will stand firm on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Touré. Through your important work uh, at the European Parliament Committee, so you do not only contribute to the European Parliament's role on uh, democracy, but of the whole EU, and we see you as a valuable ally in our work. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences during the crisis, but also to provide your vision on which challenges still need to be addressed uh, for a good continuation of parliamentary functioning. Thank you very much. With this, I would like to close the high-level part of uh, this event. And uh, I would like to thank again uh, Mr. Uh, Kevin Casasamora, Director Henriette Geiger, Vice President 
Fabio Castaldo, President Mohamed Nasheed, and uh, you, Mr. Tobe, for your brilliant contributions. Uh, I believe that it was a very, very interesting and a very good introduction also uh, to the next part of the sessions. As key representatives of your institutions, you made us confident that democracy will be well taken care of uh, during uh, the next part of the legislature and that democracy will also thrive again uh, to the benefit of societies and uh, citizens. Let's immediately uh, continue with the practitioner session. Uh, I therefore ask the participants online to stay tuned um, and um, I will then take leave of the high level speakers, although all of you are very welcome uh, to stay with us also for the next part. Thank you very much again for uh, contributing and all uh, the best. I hope that in the meantime also uh, all the next speakers have joined uh, the event or are still with us. I believe that that is uh, the fact. So let's start with the second part. Also a warm welcome. Uh, the discussion of this part of uh, the event are Dr. Piedad García Escudero Márquez, clerk and former secretary general of the Spanish Cortes Generales, Kiba Jacob, clerk and head of the financial scrutiny unit of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, and Jonathan Murphy, head of the Inter-Paris EU Global Programme on Parliaments and Partnership. Mr. Uh, Brian Caesar, Clerk of the Senate of Trinidad and Tobago and Principal Advisor to the President of the Senate is also with us and he will join the conversation in the Q&A session after the intervention. A warm welcome again to all of you. I would like to remind the participants uh, that this part of the session is interactive and that you are very welcome uh, to write your questions in the conversation pane on YouTube or on Twitter, but then please use the hashtag uh, Democracy Week 2020. And if you have any interesting background materials uh, that uh, other participants may find useful, that is very welcome to post as well. So I have the difficult task to keep the time. As you know, uh, time is running. Um, I may perhaps uh, interrupt interventions when needed with request to round up in one minute. Please apologize uh, me uh, already uh, for this. Um, the session will start with uh, Mr. Jonathan Murphy. Uh, he will kick off uh, as the head of the Inter-Paris Global Programme, and he has an immense track record on international parliamentary and democratic development support. Jonathan, you will share a presentation with us. Uh, so I ask colleagues to put it on the screen so that uh, all the participants can follow it. Despite the crisis, the Inter-Paris team has not rested for a minute over the past months and continued to develop tools and resources to support the peer-to-peer -peer projects that are being set up with parliaments across the globe. Very relevant for today's discussion are the primer you published on parliaments and crisis, challenges and innovations, and an Inter-Paris parliamentary data tracker. Please, Jonathan. You are welcome to take the floor and present some highlights of these initiatives, as well as what challenges and opportunities you can see for virtual parliaments, which is also the core topic of this session. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Marilyn, for, um, for an excellent introduction. And particularly thank you to our high-level speakers for participating in this event. And of course, to, to my fellow panelists. And uh, I will try to get over my comments quickly so that we can listen to uh, the experts in the field uh, tell us about how they have responded uh, to, the, to the pandemic. As we've talked about uh, already, um, uh, Inter-Paris has made a number of different um, uh, interventions in addressing the, uh, the, the crisis, uh, the pandemic. Um, and in the presentation, I'm going to start by talk, begin by talking briefly about some of those, uh, some of that work that we've done. Then I want to talk a little bit more about the roles that uh, 
parliaments have shown to be crucial during the price during the crisis next um, look at some of the experiences of virtual parliaments which is a key theme of our pre of our discussion today and finally look at uh, what I see as some of the prospects for virtual parliaments so in the next few slides I'm just going to show you some of the work that we have done as as Marilyn said uh, we produced a parliamentary primer during the first months of the pandemic, looking at the issues that parliaments uh, were having to deal with in the early stages of the pandemic, identifying best practices, as well as risks to parliamentary effectiveness created by the multiple impacts of the pandemic. We then, as you will see from this data tracker, uh, we set out to monitor parliaments around the world to track their evolving responses to the pandemic. This monitor, which was published at the end of June 2020, explores the practical steps that parliaments all over the world took in order to reorganize their work. For example, uh, as we're talking about further today, um, setting up virtual sessions, but also in changing rules of procedure, in introducing public health measures for MPs, as uh, as the head of the uh, of the European Union's Development Committee mentioned, and in I think very importantly, and I will talk later, uh, in providing specialized oversight to government actions on the pandemic. Um, so we'll just run through a couple of those uh, if, if we can move on to the to the next slide. Um, so at the end of the presentation, I will provide you um, uh, links uh, and to the uh, to the, the the parliamentary data tracker. And I also wanted to add that um, the parliamentary tracker, as uh, Dr. Dr. Kevin uh, Casasamora said, has been supplemented by a broader initiative of international idea. Um, ag again, as, uh, as Director Geiger mentioned, financed by the European Union, looking at the broader impacts on democracy of the pandemic and of the different government actions that have been taken to address the pandemic. And again, at the end of the presentation, there will be uh, a link to those, uh, to those two uh, two presentations, those two pieces of analysis. In the second section of the, pre of the presentation, I want to talk about the crucial roles of Parliament during the crisis. Perhaps we can move on to the next slide. Um, and I, wa I want to really go back to basics and I want to talk about the three fundamental best known roles of Parliament, which is legislation, oversight and representation. Um, and so organizing the way in which parliaments have responded to, to crisis and the way in which they have demonstrated how crucial they are, first of all, in terms of legislation, in providing proper scrutiny of legislation adopted to give government special powers and government programs to special programs to help citizens financially impacted by the pandemic. I'll give two good examples. I know that our speakers also have other good examples that their own parliaments have implemented. But for example, the Finnish parliament carefully scrutinized the proposed special powers that government had put forward and decided in a number of specific areas, no, those are going a little bit too far and we are going to limit uh, the powers, we are going to reduce some of these special powers in order to make sure that we remain uh, within a democratic framework. Then another example uh, is the scrutiny that was carried out by the Irish Parliament on uh, special economic measures, um, particularly uh, enhancing the special provisions for tenant security that Parliament extended to travellers and to Roma peoples who previously would not have been covered because of their different status as, uh, as, as holders of tenancies. Um, one key debate in general where parliaments in many countries have weighed in is ensuring that special measures have a sunset clause and they cannot be renewed without specific parliamentary debate and approval. 
And we will all have read and heard of debates where some governments attempted to introduce measures without a sunset clause. In other words, that the special measures could have continued beyond the end of the COVID crisis. Parliaments have been quite effective in making sure that there are sunset clauses. Secondly, the role of Parliament has been demonstrated as crucial in oversight of government action on the pandemic. Here, Parliaments have adopted different approaches. Some Parliaments have used their, or the committees that they already had in place to carry out oversight. Others have established special committees with a specific responsibility for looking at the COVID measures. Uh, for example, with representation of very senior parliamentarians from across different parliamentary groups. So in some cases, such as New Zealand as an example, the opposition chairs this committee, thus ensuring real transparency that the opposition heads the oversight committee looking at all the special measures that government is taking and making sure both that they meet the needs in terms of public health and economic well-being of citizens and also they respect democratic standards. And third, and also very important in the area of representation, um, very difficult trade-offs need to be made during the pandemic between opening up society, which will inevitably lead to increased cases, um, and the damaged cause to the economy and to broader social indicators by lockdowns and the curtailment of services beyond COVID-related services. This role of reflecting diverse perspectives has always been one of the unique attributes of Parliament, and it is becoming increasingly important as the pandemic continues. Whereas in the early part of the pandemic, it was popular to say that the issue is beyond politics, we should just listen to experts, we don't need too much time debating. Now we see that there are genuine debates in most countries about how to balance these different imperatives, all related to overall well-being. And we are coming to understand that in a democratic society, it's ultimately for us all, through our representatives, to decide on these difficult trade-offs. And it's not just whether bars should be open or not, but it's questions like, should children be able to go back to school? Should breast screening for cancer be restarted even though the pandemic continues? Should food production continue even though some food production facilities have been sites of the spread of the, the, the COVID virus? And it's far better for these debates to occur within Parliament and democratic discourse than through angry confrontations on the street, as we've unfortunately seen in the United States and in some other countries. Different mobs carrying guns are not going to be able to make rational and constructive and positive decisions about these difficult trade-offs. These need to occur, these debates need to occur in Parliaments a legitimate place for debate to take place peacefully, according to agreed rules, and ensuring that all voices are heard, not just the voices, the loudest voices or the voices with the biggest guns. I'd like to move now to section three of the presentation to talk a, a bit about some of the experiences of virtual parliaments. And again, I know this will be complemented by our colleagues from, from different national parliaments. I want to make two main points here. The first is that although there have been many exciting initiatives, and I think, for example, of the work of the Brazilian Parliament involving citizen comments in virtual debates, I think of the Greek Parliament's Environment Committee hearing expert testimony virtually on the link between COVID and air pollution, and coming to understand that COVID is a very specific pandemic, but it is also impacted by overall changes to our environment and ways of living, and that we need to think broadly about that. These are examples where parliaments have been able to make use of virtual technologies in a positive way. But we have to understand that the majority of parliaments have not moved in a comprehensive way to online functioning. Partly this is a question of logistics, but 
let's be honest, many parliaments with plenty of technical capacity have chosen not to move online for philosophical reasons. So both the Speaker of the Italian Chamber and the Speaker of the American House of Representatives have used almost identical language in saying, we are like captains on a ship. We must be there during a storm. We must not hide behind a video camera. This is a strong argument, and this is, this is one of the balances, again, that parliaments need to take into account. A second thing that needs to be borne in mind is that many parliaments we have found in our tracking process have altered their approach sometimes several times, increasing and reducing and increasing again the levels of virtuality according both to the changing pandemic conditions but also to the experiences of virtuality, the ways in which it has worked, the ways in which it has not worked. I'd like to end now in, in the final section by looking at some prospects. The key observations I would like to make are first, virtual functioning works best when it extends, it deepens and it strengthens in-person debate and discussion rather than taking the place of in-person debate and discussion. I think, for example, of the German Bundestag, whose finance committee essentially determines the federal budget for, the, the, for the Germany. I think it's unlikely that the cut and thrust of such a serious negotiation can be carried out as effectively on Zoom as it can be carried out around the table with the leaders or the experts from each of the individual parliamentary groups represented on the Finance Committee, being able to, to, to trade ideas, to trade possibilities, uh, to trade compromises in person. Now, at the same time, gathering input from experts, from citizen groups, of course, that is something that can be helped by using video technology. And I think this is something that will continue and should continue in the future, not just because of COVID, but because for the environment's sake, we shouldn't be flying people around the country to give 30 minute presentations. We should make use of technology that works, um, not to replace, but to deepen the work of parliaments. Second, in the longer term, I think it's more likely and more feasible for committee work, for some committee work to continue to be online than it is for plenary sessions. And we heard, uh, we heard Speaker Nasheed being very honest as a, as a speaker uh, that in a plenary session, the power that a speaker has um, in a virtual session is really quite, quite a, 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 an, an extreme power the power to absolutely cut people off, the power, uh, the, the power really to, to decide with, very, with it being very difficult for, for individual parliamentarians to challenge. Um, so I think that we may see in terms of, of plenaries some good hybrids that have been established where the norm is in-person plenary attendance, but some members for various reasons can attend and vote virtually due to illness. We had an example of, uh, of, of, uh, of the head of the, Envir of the Development Committee at the European Parliament saying that he personally had contracted COVID. Now, it, it is good that people who, whether they're sick because of COVID or they have some, that perhaps they're, they're expecting a child and it's difficult for them to travel, they should be able to participate. But that would be something that adds on to the normal physical presence within a plenary session. Excuse me, Jonathan, to interrupt mm -hmm. you. Would it be possible to round up in one minute, please? It would be, because I only have one minute more of uh, speaking <laughs> to do. So, um, and I think we also need to look a, a bit beyond Parliament's internal functioning to also look at the philosophy that Parliaments represent governance occurring in public. Um, and it goes a bit beyond what happens in the, chain, in the chamber. For example, journalists find it much harder to buttonhole ministers online than they, than they do when the minister is leaving the parliamentary chamber after giving a presentation. So this importance of, of democracy being done in public, 
which I'm not sure a controlled online environment really meets that criterion uh, of, of doing democracy in front of all the people. Now, of course, the potential for technology to assist democracy is enormous. While I think that most parliamentary work will return to in-person processes, I do believe the potential for reaching out beyond the parliamentary chamber, for operating quickly and efficiently through virtual means, will supplement that essential in-person cut and thrust of democratic parliaments. Thank you very much, Marilyn, and uh, apologies for, for over going over my time. The, um, the, the links are here. And uh, by all means, write to us uh, if you don't have time to, to write down those links, and we'll send out the presentation with the links. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. This is very interesting indeed. So no worries. And I invite the colleagues perhaps to copy paste the links that you provided in the reading pane so that people uh, present on YouTube can also click on it. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for uh, this presentation of the first findings uh, and prospects that can be drawn from the data that uh, on parliaments that your team has uh, gathered. Um, and also the examples you provided on the creativity of some parliaments to bank on the virtual opportunities uh, provided by the coronavirus are, are simply great. And uh, I am sure that uh, they can be used by other parliaments who are still looking for solutions that can work. And at any event, a, a number of conclusions provide us with uh, new ideas for niches for international parliamentary support. So great uh, job on that. I would like to turn now to uh, Dr. Piedad Garcia. Escudero Marquez, clerk and former Secretary General of the Spanish Cortes Generales, who is also Professor on Constitutional Law at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid since 2010 and has been a regular teacher already since 1995. Pidat, based on your long-standing experience at the Spanish Cortes Generales and considering the enormous challenge the pandemic posed to the Spanish society, we are very keen on hearing about your insights on the functioning of Parliament in that time of crisis and any conclusions that you could draw or any lessons to prepare the Cortes and other Parliaments for future crises. Pidat, the screen and floor are yours. Thank you very much, Marilyn, for your introduction, and thank you to uh, International IDEA for the kind invitation to take part in the International Democracy Week, especially in this practitioner session on the Parliament's responses to the pandemic. I think that we will hear again in this session many things that have already been said in the high-level session. So, I agree absolutely also with most of what uh, my the, the previous speaker has said. And I would like to stress the opportunity of this webinar in the moment when the second wave is taking place in many of our European countries and has, for instance, Excuse me, Ida, to okay. interrupt. Can you perhaps uh, get a bit closer to the microphone because it's a bit difficult to understand? Uh, I think that I put my paper uh, on it. Uh, I would like to stress the opportunity, is that okay now? Of this webinar in a moment, when a second wave is taking place in many of our countries and has, for instance, uh, already forced the suspension of all activities planned for this same week in the Spanish Autonomous Parliament. The aim of my presentation is to show how the Spanish parliaments have adapted there are ways of working due to the pandemic situation and which innovations had to be adopted. First of all, I must point out that 19 legislative assemblies coexist in Spain since we have a bicameral uh, parliament called Cortes Generales, consisting in two chambers, Congreso de los Diputados and Senate, plus 17 legislative assemblies in the Comunidades Autónomas which are autonomous territories or regions. An emergency state, state of alarm or alert, was decreed last March 14 by the Spanish government. Such event had happened only once in more than 40 years of constitutional democracy, but back then it did not affect to, uh, the parliament's normal functioning or functions. 
The peculiarity of the new situation was the health crisis in which we were and we still are immersed with the consequent risks of infection, difficulties to travel and of accommodation, even the hotels were closed. The obstacles to attend parliamentary meetings are no novelty. When the Spanish Cortes assembled in 1810, they had to do it in a city under siege at the southern end of an occupied Spain. There are provisions in the 1812 Constitution for the substitution of MPs in case of impossibility. The health crisis affected the parliamentary activity. Parliament in quarantine, with a question mark, is the title of a newly published book. But parliaments are not allowed to be in quarantine. They must be present. It has already been said. They must be there in order to preserve separation of powers and representative democracy, precisely when the balance of powers might be disrupted. The Spanish Constitution requires the Congress of Deputies, the lower chamber, to be present during all the emergency states. Senate and territorial assemblies must exercise their function of oversight of the government's action, which is especially needed in a time when most powers are concentrated in the executive branch, it has already been said. Therefore, parliaments had to respond to the situation provoked by the pandemic, even without enough means, neither technological nor legal, since there were no adequate provisions in the rules of procedure. Nevertheless, not all the options were acceptable. There may be constitutional or legal boundaries that should not be broken to remain within the limits of the rule of law and democracy, that has already been said too. Recent decisions of the Spanish Constitutional Court, truth be told, in a very different context, had emphasized the importance of immediacy of place and time, the being present. The Spanish Constitution also prohibits to the houses of Cortes Generales the delegation of vote. The vote of deputies and senators is personal and cannot be delegated. The circumstances surrounding the crisis were not favorable for undertaking any reform of the rules of procedure, where different types of uh, remote vote or delegated vote in some autonomous assemblies had already been established, mostly due to the fact of the increasing number of women MPs. But these rules were not sufficient. In a few words, autonomous parliaments to were dissolved back then for elections to be held in April, which had to be postponed, the autonomous parliaments opted for one of these solutions. One, activating the permanent committee, which in my opinion was not correct because it is a continuity body that can only act when the parliament is dissolved or not in ordinary session. Two, maintaining the presence of a, the presence of a limited number of MPs in sessions, the rest of them uh, voting remotely in absentia to respect the social distance and health recommendations. Three, holding sessions, especially committee meetings by video conference, not without incidents in Madrid Regional Assembly. An attempt to hold a telematic plenary session had to be cancelled a few minutes after the beginning due to technical failure. In these decisions and in its comparison with the adopted in the Congress and Senate, we must take into account the size of the house and the territorial area it represents. Being present is easier in a parliament with 30 members at 100 kilometers distance than in the Congreso de los Diputados with 350 deputies or the Senate with 265 senators. The Congress of Deputies, the lower house of the Cortes Generales, was called by the Constitution to a star role, since according to the constitutional text, it has to be informed by the government of the declaration of a state of alarm. It must authorize every extension of this declaration. It happened six times for 15 days periods, reaching a total of three months and one week with different degrees of confirmation. The House cannot be dissolved when emergency states are declared. 
In addition to that, the Constitution stresses that the principle of accountability of government remains intact during emergency states. Therefore, the oversight function must be kept going. So, after the initial for 15 days of quasi-suspension of activity, even if the information by the Prime Minister took place, the Congress was forced to assemble often for the authorization of alarm extensions and the validation of emergency legislation issued by the government through the trees laws. Furthermore, once the second extension of the alarm state was adopted, it became clear to parliaments that they ought to reinitiate their activity in their own view and according to public opinion. Thus, after a month, the oversight weekly sessions were retaken mid-April with question time and interpolations to government. Ordinary legislation would come later on and first laws were passed in July. And how are or were the sessions managed? With a very short number of MPs present at the beginning, 45 of 350, a number rising by and by until the current 134, more than one third of the House. The rest of MPs, even present in their adjoining offices, vote remotely, thanks to an extension to all deputies and the same in Senate of the rules of procedure provisions for maternity or illness. Some minor formalities have been lifted, such as the confirmation of vote by telephone or email and the authorization for voting remotely must be asked by every parliamentary group in the name of all their number, their member MPs. As general conclusions, and bearing in mind the aforementioned, I would say that the Spanish Cortes Generales resisted the easy temptation of Parliament in absence. The Parliament has to sit physically, has uh, the Vice President of the European Parliament said, um, he has uh, very graphically expressed it. And uh, Cortes Generales reinitiated activity as soon as possible. Ordinary oversight after a month of unusual inactivity, nevertheless holding debates and votes during that period, which maintained Parliament's presence. A special committee for reconstruction worked hard for two months and had some conclusions adopted last July by the Congress. And similar committees or inquiry committees have been created in autonomous regional parliament. Uh, Mr. Murphy has explained the role of these committees. As a final conclusion, I would say that to the two traditional essential requirements of parliament's activity, that is deliberation and publicity, a third immediacy of time and place, closeness, we say immediatividad, but immediacy is just of time and not of place. So, closeness should be added. That has also been said at the high level previous session. And the question is if virtual parliament can fulfill this requirement with a non present assembly. Our constitutional court has pointed out the symbolic quality of plenary as a body representing and making present the people equality that cannot be obtained in absentia. Let us reflect on it before we get into the temptation. And uh, Marilyn, I am going to ask for an additional minute to answer your introductory question on lessons for the future. The first lesson is that we must keep open our minds. Mind first of all. I thought that I was going to be old minded and now I see that everybody thinks that Parliament must reinitiate their presidential activity. So I am very happy. Nevertheless, we must uh, take an advantage of what we have learned, as also has been said. The second uh, would be um, that parliaments must reinforce, reinforce uh, their technological means. Um, uh, also, their legal provisions and it has also been said for emergency uh, situations in general, not particularly this one, because then it won't be useful in the next one. But with so generally planned, but with every guarantee for their adoption. And um, the last one would be that essential elements um, should be preserved in the functioning of Parliament 
for democracy to be maintained. As uh, has already been said, also strengthening parliament is strengthening uh, democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Piedad. You raised uh, a number of uh, new aspects uh, that were not mentioned before uh, that we have to count with uh, in relation to COVID-19 uh, crisis, such as the challenges on remote voting, uh, the implications for gender equality and the alignment of new procedural uh, modalities with the constitution of countries. And so this is really interesting uh, things to study and, and draw conclusions from. Thank you also, Piedad, for adding uh, your recommendation for the future that is uh, really appreciated. So now as the last speaker uh, of today, uh, we are honored to welcome Keiba Jacob, who is procedural clerk and head of the financial scrutiny unit of the Parliament of, the Trinita, uh, of Trinidad and Tobago. We very much appreciate uh, the openness of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago to engage in the interparliamentary cooperation and the inter-Paris uh, global project. So we look forward, uh, Keba, you will have a presentation to show, so I invite you to also put it on the screen. And uh, we look forward to hearing about the way in which the Parliament of uh, Trinidad adapted to the crisis and even set up an inquiry uh, an inquiry scrutinizing the governance response to the COVID-19 pandemic. How did it work in practice? Please, uh, Kiba, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marilyn. So, um, in Trinidad and Tobago, we implemented a number of measures to adapt during the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, we felt, the Parliament felt that it was important to continue the work of Parliament both in debates and via um, our parliamentary oversight function. So in terms of debates, and I mean, just like, just like my colleagues before, we had challenges, but I think we, we of the Trinidad and Tobago Parliament believe that we have more opportunities than challenges. So we, like many of the other parliaments, we did not go, we did not have virtual sittings or plenary sessions. Our debates took place in person. However, we uh, implemented a number of measures to ensure the safety of members, staff, and stakeholders visiting the parliamentary complex during those debates. So we did a reconfiguration of the chambers to ensure social distancing. And we also um, reduced speaking time for members. And this was done via a motion to suspend the standing orders, the standing order um, relative to speaking time. We also created an isolated debating chamber in the, in the chamber for members to speak without wearing a mask. And this debating chamber, this isolated debating chamber was sanitized after each member utilized um, that area. Um, we also limited the overall number of persons in the chamber and we created workspaces for members of parliament to utilize around the parliamentary complex. In the limiting of the persons in the chamber, it, it was applicable to members of parliament, staff, as well as the media. It's important to note that although we limited the number of media personnel in the chamber, uh, media could conduct interviews in our rotunda or other parts of the building um, by making an appointment with a member. So the, the media's access to members of parliament and parliamentary proceedings was not limited in any way. And all of our proceedings are broadcast live on the Parliament's de dedicated television channel, as well as we have a YouTube channel and um, our proceedings are broadcast live via YouTube as well. Um, because of the, uh, because members were, all members were not in the chamber and that limited number of members in the chamber, um, whenever there is a vote, we allowed members three minutes to return to the chamber to, to cast their votes. Um, so that was a unique procedure that, um, that, we, that was agreed upon by both sides, by the government and the opposition. And there was a lot of co collaboration between the government and the opposition in ensuring that all persons utilizing the parliamentary complex were kept safe. Our debates um, were related to things um, provisions that the government intended to introduce in relation or in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as other legislation, other critical legislation that had been on the parliamentary calendar um, for some time. So um, 
and and the the the, the thing about just to discuss the interaction with members um, while members could not all members could not be in the chamber the debates and so was not as lively what we found is that these working spaces allowed members to collaborate in a different type of way uh, than they would have been able to if they were in the chamber so you saw groups of members working collaborating on things you saw ministers meeting with members of the opposition discussing issues in constituencies and and, and, and that sort of thing so what we what we missed or what we did not have in terms of the activity in the chamber and the liveliness of the debate you saw it throughout the parliamentary complex as we move on to discuss the parliamentary oversight and what we did in relation to parliamentary oversight as marilyn said we did continue to conduct um, an inquiry our inquiry started in january long before there was um, a case a positive um, covid 19 case in trinidad and tobago and um, it continued even during our lockdown we went into a lockdown in the middle of march on to the end of april and um, during that lockdown period we continued our committee oversight or parliamentary oversight via um, written correspondence to ministries and departments. Um, coming out of the um, of the, our lockdown, we transitioned to virtual meetings. It was felt that the virtual meetings for committees, it was an easier transition for our parliament. Um, just to give a context of the size of our parliament, we have a total of 73 members and our parliament is bicameral. So it was easy for us to implement the social distancing mechanisms and so and keep everyone safe because our, we don't have the large numbers as some of other parliaments. Um, we also, so as we, we went into virtual sittings, other committee meetings, other committee, um, co other committees started to also continue their oversight work into the um, delivery of education during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as other issues in scrutiny of bills or legislation that was before the parliament. So parliamentary work continued in the oversight area as well. Um, in terms of the challenges, um, our challenges um, were surrounding the legal authority for virtual sittings. And um, just like some of our colleagues said before in terms of voting, and then for us, we also considered um, the effect on parliamentary privilege. So these things are still being worked out. Um, just in case that in the future we need to, we may need to have a virtual sitting. We want to make sure that we resolve the, the legal challenges that we may have. The other challenge is related to the hybrid, because we had in-person plenary meetings or parliamentary sittings, and then virtual committee meetings. Sometimes on the same day, a member of parliament may have a virtual meeting and an in-person meeting. So it was difficult for them to commute between the two meetings, as opposed to if the, if the two meetings were virtual, it would be a lot easier to transition from one to the other. Um, another challenge for us was the, um, the, the expansion of the ICT capabilities in terms of um, our web-based platforms, um, expanding our capacity uh, to use Microsoft Teams and also um, um, Zoom. We also had to expand the capacity of members and staff to utilize the technology. So we did, so which is why we, there was a bit of a delay before we started our virtual committee meetings, because we did test sessions with members and staff, testing cameras, camera angles, lighting, audio, you know, and, and, and really making sure that our members were ready and also that they were presented in a manner that was fitting for them to be viewed by the public. Because of course, all of these hearings, while they were home, they were um, operating either from their, from their constituency offices or from their, from their residents. The, um, the other challenge for us was the, the, the health and well-being of staff and members. Included in our parliamentary complex, we have um, uh, gym facilities for staff and other other wellness facilities um, available to staff and members and the challenge for us was transitioning these things especially in these trying times especially where you are um, cut off from the routines that you've grown accustomed to and that the routines that we have given you comfort um, it, that was the challenge and it is going to be um, 
it is one of the things that we are looking at moving forward because the health and well-being of parliamentarians and staff is, is critical for the work of parliament to continue. And then we have the, the other challenge we saw was the maintenance of COVID-19 protocols because you have to do social distancing. Culturally, we are a very um, we are very expressive people. We like to shake hands and we hug and we greet each other physically. Um, that's our culture. So it, it was important to make sure that we remind members and staff all the time, maintain your distance, um, also including um, ensuring that there was um, sanitizing stations throughout the facility and the complex and so. So that, 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 is a, that was a bit of a challenge for us and it will continue to be a challenge because we have to continue to maintain those protocols. As I said, um, the, the challenges, uh, while the challenges are um, a few, I think that the opportunities are, are better. And, um, and most of those challenges, with time, we can um, overcome them. So in terms of the opportunities, some of the opportunities include cost savings. I mean, as the head of the Financial Scrutiny Committee um, unit and, and Parliament scrutinizes public expenditure, the Parliament itself would also be concerned about its expenditure. And so we've seen a lot of cost savings for the Parliament as well as individual cost savings for, for staff because um, the Parliament no longer has to, because we're not sitting, we're not having meetings, we don't have to provide meals and amenities and so um, accommodation for members who come from our sister aisle. So we are seeing some cost savings there. And in terms of staff, in terms of personal savings for staff, you we have to commute less because you're home, you could prepare your meals at home. So there are also those personal cost savings. Um, we have been trying, the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago has been trying to be to become a paperless parliament. We have had some success. Of course, there are some members um, and staff, um, I may be guilty of that, who may be a little bit slower to come to move into the paperless world. Um, but this, um, this the virtual committee meetings in particular um, has for, uh, forced many of us to move into that um, paperless environment. And um, of course, there'll be cost savings. And, um, and so we're happy about that opportunity. And in terms of, um, the, I mentioned earlier, the reduction of speaking time. That reduction in speaking time has resulted in a in in what what we would what we would call a better use of the parliament's time. In the parliamentary sittings, no longer um, extend into the late hours of the night. We're usually finished by eight p.m. and so members, or or sometimes even long before that, and members and staff get to return to their home because, as I said, for our parliamentary sittings, we meet in person. Um, virtual committee meetings, I think this is one of the most amazing parts um, of the, um, or one of the most amazing opportunities that we have. Um, because we are a twin island state, we have members coming from our sister isle because the parliament is located on the island of Trinidad. And so the um, virtual committee meetings allow our members coming from Tobago to to participate in meetings while staying at home with their family while staying safe. And so if they had to come to parliament, they would only attend parliament for the for the plenary sessions or the sittings of parliament. Um, please keep I excuse me for interrupting. If you could round up in one minute, that would be wonderful. Sure, sure, sure. And um and then piggybacking on that same virtual committee meetings. It also allowed for greater citizen engagement because we were able to, to have persons participate in the committee, committee meetings virtually without having to attend parliament. Um, and then we also see great opportunities for training for members and staff and um, increased opportunities for collaborations like, like the one we have with, with Inter Paris. So, so, so I, I think we have lots of great things um, coming out of this. It's been challenging, but we hope we cho we've chosen to focus on the opportunities. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Absolutely interesting. Um, I call, uh, recall perhaps especially the solutions uh, that were found for organizing 
hybrid virtual meetings and uh, the establishment of uh, legal authority for virtual sittings. Besides, of course, increasing the ICT capacities, which every parliament uh, uh, on without any doubt had uh, needed to do. And then perhaps uh, uh, I also will remind uh, that the reduction of speaking time is uh, not an obstacle to the participation of MPs. So that is very good news. And we welcome absolutely the enlarged space for international cooperation that perhaps results uh, from uh, crisis situations uh, such as these. So now I turn uh, to a new round of questions. We have a very little time that is left. Uh, the colleagues have asked uh, to round up around 16.30 this session. So perhaps we can uh, take one or two questions and may I prioritize perhaps the questions uh, coming from uh, the floor from the audience and uh, perhaps uh, one of the speakers feels called to, to take it. Uh, a question that came from Twitter is what particular challenges might uh, operate virtually uh, posed to parliaments returning after elections. So for example, uh, will consensus, scrutiny and policy making be harder if new MPs are less able to have informal interactions on which to build working relationships? And what can parliamentarians and parliamentary officials do to mitigate against those challenges? I may perhaps add uh, that part because it is indeed highlighting one of the aspects that uh, we have not talked so much about, that is how virtual parliaments can communicate their work effectively Effectively and better engage with citizens. Um, uh, is any of the speakers very inclined to take that question? I see Jonathan raising his can, hand. Please, Jonathan. I, I'm raising my hand to say I don't want to speak. And I think that uh, Trinidad and Tobago would be perfect to respond to this because you've just had an election. So, so you have practical first person, uh, first person knowledge of this. And perhaps Brian has been sitting very, very uh, quietly and perhaps Brian could take the floor if Kiba wanted to add anything. Sorry to jump in and I have finished my in intervention so don't ask me again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much Jonathan. Thank you very much Marilyn. Um, it is an interesting question and it is one that we in Trinidad and Tobago would have had only recently to consider. Um, in our constitution, section 65 or 55 sorry of our constitution, it does allow for parliamentary privilege and immunity to members, so that members enjoy uh, a freedom, a freedom of speech, in a way that the ordinary jundu does not enjoy. One of the concerns that we had to treat with, and, and, and maybe I should back up a bit, because we have what is called a proclamation, and a proclamation is what sets out where the parliament is to meet to conduct its parliamentary business. And in that proclamation, President of the Republic, um, on the opening of Parliament, it is read into the parliamentary record, and therein commences uh, the parliamentary session. What happened on this occasion was that we were, in fact, considering the possibility of facilitating virtual sessions, but because there was a gray area as to how those virtual sessions may impact the issue of immunity and parliamentary privilege, it was felt that there's a need for greater research, and I think Kiba touched on it. And therefore, even though we are in this new period and this new way of doing business, it is one of the reasons for which we have halted somewhat on the whole notion of having parliamentary sittings virtually. It is something I suspect that we will have to come back to in the future, because the research has been done, the jury is out on it, but certainly that is one of the issues that we had to contend with in this new parliamentary era, in this new era of, of, of doing business in the global, in this global pandemic. Thank you very much, Brian. That is fantastic. Um, uh, with your experience from the Senate of the uh, of the Parliament of Trinidad and uh, Tobago, you were indeed uh, extremely well placed uh, to take that question. Uh, would we have uh, other questions from uh, the audience, colleagues? I'm not sure about that. I think we have uh, time for one more question. 
Uh, perhaps on the parliamentary innovations, and I think some of the speakers already uh, answered in part that question, but it is nice perhaps to recall which of the in innovations that we have seen and that we have discussed uh, that are emerging practices uh, from the COVID crisis are likely to be retained after the pandemic, and perhaps which of those you think are less recommendable to to, uh, to maintain after the crisis. Uh, who would like to take it? May I ask perhaps Pira to step in? Okay. Um, perhaps to remain the vote, the remote vote, I think that it is very practical, especially for MPs, and it's very dangerous. It has already been said today, too, that the they must become accustomed to that because they can uh, go from the, go away from the session before voting. I think that it should not be extended too much. Also, weekly information from the minister relevant in the matter. Case in that case, it was established since the first extension of the state of alarm. Uh, it was one of the conditions to vote this extension, and so. He came weekly to the committee, relevant uh, committee, to uh, update information. I think that uh, has that is very important. That it is a new lesson. Um, uh, Parliament must be kept up to date. Also, sending information it has also been included in the conditions of the extension. And the less, perhaps, the reduce uh, presence of members in sessions. At the the restrictions are being lifted by and by and for instance in spain have, uh, they have already been listed for committee sessions thank you thank you that is uh, a nice answer indeed uh, will any of the other speakers uh, like to provide some perspectives on this question anyone to step in if that is not the case uh, it uh, will be perhaps good because time is almost up. Um, and then I can invite the participants to contact us bilaterally for any questions that you uh, may not have seen answered during this session and any questions you may have on uh, the programmes or on uh, the parliaments uh, that were featured uh, during the session. Well, I found it extremely interesting uh, today. So thank you very, very much again, uh, Pida Garcia Escudero Marquez. Kiva, Jacob, Brian Caesar and Jonathan Murphy for your truly outstanding contributions. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I may therefore end with uh, the immense honor to close this important uh, Democracy Week 2020. I hope that for all participants, for all the partners involved, that it was interesting and useful for your work. Uh, and that the online format of uh, the event brought more advantages to you than any downsides. I think that the high-level institutional and expert engagement in all the sessions illustrate a shared drive to push for democracy from the European Union and other institutions and as well the warm community of democracy organizations. And I think that as a Commission President has uh, recalled in the State of the Union, um, Democracy is a very big priority of the EU, and we see that because in uh, the State of the Unions of uh, all the last years, uh, it, it was featured uh, much more than uh, before. It can just not be underestimated how important it is for the democracy community to feel supported in our work and the endeavors. And I hope that uh, this series of events had also an empowering effect for anyone uh, tuning in. So I uh, am left with thanking uh, the democracy partners, European Partnership for Democracy, European Endowment for Democracy, uh, European Network of Political Parties, uh, Carnegie Europe, but also the European Parliament for this excellent uh, cooperation, also the communications team of the European Parliament, because they did a tremendous work for us. And uh, thank you for the great job to make this all happen. And we together look forward to 
continue this cooperation next year. But I cannot leave you without mentioning the hard work of the coordination team with Gosia Calabro, Evelyn Montoyo, Susanna Niep, Maria Kuman, Alino Garkova, and so many others who helped uh, organizing this whole week of sessions. Thank you also, Elena Botanina and Ingrid Walker, and the International Ideas ICTs and Communications team to help to facilitate uh, today's event. So the International Day of Democracy does not stop here. Let's ensure that it lasts a whole year. And I hope that we inspired both institutions and assistance providers and parliaments to enhance cooperation and also coordination between each other so that we can make a difference that also benefits people uh, in the end. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, excellent speakers, for taking the time uh, for your valuable contributions. And I wish you all a very nice continuation of the day. Please stay tuned with your organizations and programs. Thank you very much.